Good morning. It's wonderful to see all of you out this morning. For those of you who I've not gotten the chance to introduce myself to, my name is Micah Simpkins. I'm from Shelbyville, Tennessee, originally. Um, I'm down here uh, for school at Florida College. I'm in my junior year. This is my second year at Florida College, but I'm in my junior year of college. And i uh, been blessed with this opportunity to get to speak before you. Uh, it is my desire to preach the Word of God uh, after I get out of school. And this is a fantastic opportunity to come before a group of people that I do not know, but you're my brothers and sisters. And I'm very honored to be before you today and to speak the Word of God. Turn with me to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24, we'll start in verse 10 in just a minute. But first of all, let me say, today we are speaking from the Word of God. We're reading from the Word of God, and that is our aim. Speak only where God speaks. And so if I go beyond that today, you would be my friend to let me know if I've done so. So getting into the scriptures... Let's read verse 10. This is Paul giving his defense before Felix, the governor. And it says in verse 10 of Acts chapter 24, Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they had neither found me in the temple, disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself also always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. Now after many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation, and in the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult, they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. Unless it is for this one statement which I cried out standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by you this day. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. So he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and, let, and to let him have liberty, and told him not to forbid any of his friends to provide for or visit him. And after some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. You'll notice here that Paul is giving a defense before the governor, Felix. He's been accused by the Jews of stirring up the crowds and causing trouble about this way that they call a sect. And while Paul does give some defense for his action, saying that he did nothing wrong, let's make no mistake that Paul uses that, this opportunity to preach the gospel, as he always does. And it's interesting to me that he brings attention to Jesus Christ and the gospel even when his life was in jeopardy. When his life was in jeopardy, he didn't think of himself. He didn't think to get himself out of trouble but rather he kept presenting the very gospel for which he was in prison in the first place. 
This was the very gospel that had caused him threats to his life. And no matter what circumstances, nor whom he was before, Paul kept preaching the gospel. And before Felix preached the gospel, he did. It says Paul spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. I'd like to look at these three topics this morning. Dig into what the Word of God says about them. Maybe look into some things that Paul perhaps might have said to Felix. It does not record this sermon as it does some of his others. So, let's look in God's Word about what he has to say about these three subjects. Starting with righteousness. Now, righteousness in the Greek is dikaiosune, which comes from dikaios, or simply righteous. Now, Thayer's definition of dikaios, it states that in a broad sense, it means to be upright or virtuous, keeping the commands of God. But in a narrower sense, it means to be just and to render to each one his due. And we think of this, in essence, this is the whole of the law. In Matthew 22, when Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment of all, he says that the first and greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all of your heart, soul, your strength, and your mind. And the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. And in these, are we simply... Are, are we not simply both being upright and virtuous and rendering to each one what they are due? To God, we are rendering love and honor and reverence. To our fellow men, we are rendering that which we, what, what we would have for ourselves. And so, if a man is righteous, if a man has that characteristic of righteousness, he has fulfilled the law in its whole. And so we can see that if righteousness is the total fulfillment of the law, then this is an important topic to grasp. So what can we learn from God's word about righteousness? Turn with me to Psalm chapter 11. Psalm chapter 11, we'll read verse 7. It says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. The Lord is a righteous God. And He expects His people, His creation... To be righteous like him. And it says that he loves righteousness. He loves righteous people. Furthermore, if God loves righteous people, then we need to have a standard for righteousness. We aren't just left out on a limb to figure out what righteousness is for ourselves. God has given us a standard for righteousness. Turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119, and we'll read verse 172. It says, My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. All of his commandments are righteousness. Every single one. He makes them in order for us to be able to be just people who render to each one what they are due. And we can take from this that anything that goes against His commandments are unrighteousness, they're lawlessness. And so, if we are to be righteous people, if we are to be upright in rendering to each one what they are due, then logically, we must be seeking God's commandments because all of His commandments are righteousness. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus begins that famous sermon with the Beatitudes. And one of them in verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We know that since God's commandments are righteousness, then we can infer that hungering and thirsting for righteousness naturally leads us to God's Word. We are hungering and thirsting for God's Word. Have you ever thought about it that way? You know, so often we talk about ourselves or we talk about other people and we think, we say, they're really good people. They, they're, they're trying to do what's right. They have good hearts. And I understand the sentiment in that. I, underdo, I, I really do. However, we need to remember that if a person is truly desiring to be righteous, then that will naturally lead them to God's Word. There is no other source of righteousness but God Himself. He is Righteousness. So if we are children of God, and the Lord loves righteousness, if His commandments are righteousness, and we know His commandments by seeking them out, does it not naturally follow that to be righteous people, we must obey His commandments? Turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. So that is to say, we must, be, we must work righteousness to be accepted by God. That is, we must obey His commandments. Now I realize all of that is, should be rudimentary to us. We should all understand that we've known that most of our lives. But that's as it should be. Because righteousness is the guiding principle behind all we do as Christians. It truly is. And it is upon that foundation of righteousness that we begin to build other things, like self-control. Turn with me to Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. We'll read verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And over in 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence... Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Self-control is a key Christian virtue. It's mentioned as a fruit of the Spirit and one of the character traits that we need to add to faith in order to be, not to be unfruitful or barren. So as, as we can see, it's important. We know that it's important, but what exactly is self-control? Self-control, as defined by Thayer's, is the virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. One gospel preacher from the early to mid 20th century says, Temperance, that is self-control, is total abstinence from all forms of that which is evil, and moderation in that which is good. 
furthermore, this word comes from another Greek word, which is defined as having power over, or mastering, controlling, or restraining. So what can we take from all of that information? When we look at righteousness and self-control, we can see that they work together. Because righteousness is being concerned with doing what is right and doing it. But self-control aids in that by mastering your passions and your desires. Paul talks about this very idea in Romans chapter 7. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7. We'll read verse, starting in verse 21. Romans 7 verse 21. I find then a law, that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul discusses here the conflict that we have between our spirit and our flesh. He says in verse 22 that he delights in the law of God, in his inner being. He is a man who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. There is no doubt about that. However, he says that in his members, in his body, There is something else, another law, waging against his mind. This is the law of fleshly gratification, the law of sin, he says, that we all have within ourselves. Within each one of us, we have fleshly desires, for food, for drink, for sexual gratification, and all other forms of bodily pleasure that constantly cry out to be fed. However, we know that these all must be fed within the proper boundaries that God has given us and with moderation. And this is where self-control comes into play. We must be lords over our own bodies. Bring our bodies into subjection. Self-control then is the process by which we bring our bodies in line with our minds that are already dedicated to righteousness. And so, how do we get self-control? How do we put self-control in action? Might I suggest that it's as simple as we begin practicing it. It must become a habit with us. What I mean by that is that we must in every facet of our lives, bring our bodies under the subjection of our minds. And then continue in doing that. And that includes in eating, in drinking, in matters of sexuality, in exercise, in health, etc. As much as it depends on us, we have to bring our bodies under our control. We cannot let any of our passions and desires master us. That's what we talked about this morning. To do such is uncleanness. Self-control is the opposite of that. For time's sake, we won't read these examples, but I'd like to bring up two examples of self-control in the Old Testament. First, that of Joseph. We remember in Genesis chapter 39 that Joseph has been sold into slavery in Egypt. And yet, as a slave in Potiphar's house, Potiphar notices this man is different. He notices that the Lord prospers all that Joseph does. And one day, Potiphar's wife has eyes for Joseph and begins to try to seduce him, saying, lie with me. 
And Joseph says no. And day after day, she pleads with him and keeps trying until one day she grabs him by the coat and Joseph flees, leaving his coat with her. And might I suggest that that kind of self-control that Joseph had didn't happen overnight. And we, in fact, we can infer that from the text. Potiphar notices that Joseph is a responsible man, no doubt practicing self-control in many areas of his life. And so that in the height of his sexual desire, he was somewhere between 17 and 30 at this point, and no doubt a beautiful woman who had much to offer, Joseph has the self-control to say no. I will not do that against my master nor against God. And again, I will say that did not happen overnight. That wasn't a spur of the moment decision. He had been practicing self-control up until that point and continued doing that. And then we look at Daniel, the young man taken into captivity by the Babylonians and was being courted by the Babylonians to go and, go and be a part of their culture. To take of the delicacies and the strong drink, most likely, that the Babylonian court had to offer. But Daniel and his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, said, no, we will not. We will not engage our flesh in these worldly pleasures, in this gluttony and drunkery. We will not. And again, I can say confidently, but that did not happen overnight. These men showed self-control in that, but they had been practicing self-control long before that. And it is the same with us. In order to master our passions and our desires of the flesh, it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lifetime of effort. And we will most likely never have it perfectly down. But we have to try, and we have to be diligent to have self-control in everything that we do. Now after one has talked about righteousness and self-control, it is quite natural to talk about the judgment to come. Because righteousness is God's moral standard for His people. Self-control is the means by which we achieve that righteous standard. And the judgment to come is a reward for those who have achieved, or punishment for those who do not achieve. The same gospel preacher I mentioned a moment ago also had this to add. When one loses sight of God's standard of righteousness and temperance, one naturally denies the judgment. And this being written anywhere in the ballpark of the 1930s to 1950s, people then were denying the judgment, just like they are today. However, we can see from God's word that judgment is coming. It's a fact of life. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto men to die once. And then after this, the judgment. It is inevitable that all of mankind will die. Whether your spirit is separated from your body at physical death, or whether your spirit is separated from your body in the day of the coming of the Lord, you will die. And as inevitable as that fact is, that you will die, it is also inevitable that you will be judged for all that you have done. And yes, it is a fact that judgment will come, but we must also realize that in this judgment, we are to be judged 
according to how we have lived our lives. All of that will be taken into consideration. And each man is accountable for what they've done. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, impenitent heart you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deed. It is whether we have worked righteousness or not in our lives and whether or not we have obeyed God that we will be judged. And make no mistake about it, God will render to each one of us according to our deeds. We are all accountable for ourselves and no one else is accountable for us. We are accountable for ourselves in the day of judgment. Turn with me now to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, this was also referenced this morning in class. Verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So if we are to be judged according to our righteousness, does it not make sense that we are to be judged according to the standard of righteousness, God's word? Well, this is a sobering and terrifying thought. For many, I find this to be a comforting thought. God has given us the exact standard by which we will be judged in the last day. There is no guessing on where we stand or uncertainty about it. If we are following God's word, then we will be saved. And those who do not follow his word will be condemned. It is truly that simple. But here's a problem with that. The problem is, is that none of us measure up to God's standard of righteousness. None of us have perfectly controlled our fleshly passions and desires. Romans 3 verse 10 says, There is none righteous. No, not one. And yet Paul addresses that later in the chapter. Put down in verses 21 through 26 of Romans chapter 3. Now typically I read from the New King James Version as I have this morning. But I particularly liked the phrasing of the New American Standard. Where it says in Romans 3, 21. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood, through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be, that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. We are justified or we are made righteous as a gift by His grace, God's grace, through Jesus Christ. This is accomplished by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and by our obedience to the gospel. 
You see, the yoke of perfect righteousness is impossible to bear, but the yoke of Jesus Christ is easy, and His burden is light. If we will but believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of our sins, confess before men that He is the Son of God, be baptized for the remission of sins, and remain faithfully committed to His righteousness and Him, then we can have eternal life. We can be saved from the judgment that is to come. So looking back at righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, what we talked about, about today is not exactly what Paul mentioned on that day before Felix. But I have no doubt that we hit on some of the points that Paul made to Felix. Let's look, let's look again at his reaction. Felix's reaction to Paul's sermon. Acts 24, verse 25. Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. We see there that Paul, something that Paul said resonated with Felix because we see, we see that he became afraid. And yet, even though something definitely hit Felix, his response is, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. And perhaps, there are some of you this morning who are thinking about the things that we have said, the things that we have talked about together, and are thinking, I'll get to making my life right with God at a more convenient time. But brethren, there is no more convenient time than what we have right now. We are all assembled here today in the presence of God. God is with us. And He desires to see everyone here in this building right with Him. For those of you who have not obeyed the gospel, There's water for baptism right here. And servants of the Lord willing to aid you in that. For those of you who have obeyed the gospel but have not been pursuing righteousness and need to make your life right with God, we have already said that the Lord is here and He is with us. You can ask Him for forgiveness. Make your life right with Him. But also, your brothers and sisters are here. And you can confess your sins to them. And you will be healed. As it says in James 5.16. There is no more convenient time to make your life right with God than right now because the opportunity is right before you. In just a few moments, we will sing an invitation song. And all it takes is just a few steps down the aisle. And you can make your life right with God. The opportunity is right there. And may I remind you that you may not get an op another opportunity. The Lord may come. Or you may not live. Between now, this opportunity... And the next opportunity. And if that should happen, you will desperately wish that you could have taken hold of this opportunity. But it will be too little too late. And so, if you need to take advantage of this opportunity, I beg you, I urge you, Come, while we stand and sing.